Welcome to HD Nation, your guide in the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey everyone, I'm Robert Heron. And we got a lot of great stuff coming up in today's show. First of all, the most exciting news from Amazon ever. <laughs> Finally, Amazon Prime is available on Android. Instant video. No, I'm lying, man. Oh. Amazon held a press conference today to introduce its new streaming device, the Fire TV, which has people excited because apparently not only does it look like a stack of coasters, it's right there, kids, uh, but apparently you can talk to it, you can use voice commands if you want to use the microphone like a remote. Woo! Quad-core CPU, dedicated GPU, uh, very Roku-like Bluetooth remote with voice search, two gigs of RAM, dual-band Wi-Fi, three times the performance power of Apple TV, Roku, and Chromecast, possibly because they want you to use it as a gaming device. Look at this, kid. Scroll, scroll, scroll. There it is. <gasps> Minecraft Pocket Edition. And look at that, there's a Pocket Edition Amazon Fire Game Control that is sold separately. 40 bucks. 40 bucks. Uh, HDMI, uh, an optical audio output, USB. Uh, very image heavy interface, but from what we've seen in the video so far, very zippy performance. Launch apps. Amazon Video, Netflix, Hulu Plus, Watch ESPN, Showtime, MLB, uh, YouTube. There's games, there's apps, there's photos. Looks a lot like Plex, a lot of people are saying. We don't know if it actually has Plex underneath the lid. I doubt it, but you never know. Uh, they're doing an overlay of IMDb data, which is much nicer than, say, the Amazon Prime app on Roku, which you have to dig down and bury to find the, or dig underneath the, just click too many times to <laughs> get the IMDb data. Um, so like lyrics that. for music. Uh, karaoke free time, time. Free time. Karaoke time? Kara well, actually, well. karaoke time for adults. Free time for kids, which is a custom-built environment for kids three to eight years old. You tell me it's going to be more useful than the Netflix kids environment that I find so frustrating. Well, that was one of the things they hired. They highlighted during the presentation right. just parental controls in general, having the ability to say, you know what, I can set this up, my kid can have a good time with it. Yet, if they try to go anywhere outside of the kid-approved environment, they'll require a password for that, which they'll have to go ask mom and dad for. And mm -hmm. and I think that's going to help a lot of parents actually yeah. make this a an easier integration into the home theater environment. So Free content from Sesame Street, PBS Kids, uh, Nickelodeon. I also will say uh, Amazon Instant Video has a great collection. All of the, the Viacom cartoons, the Nick Jr. cartoons that used to be on uh, Netflix are now available on Amazon Prime, have been for a while. Uh, I think games started at $1.85 per game. 55-hour uh, battery life for the controller. Still no video app for Android. Uh, obviously no 4K, no transcoding. Um, and I would just have to say, uh, one of my industry friends quickly pointed out they, they felt this almost should have been a free thing for Prime members, especially folks now right. signing up for the $99 version of Amazon Prime. But, you know, that's a, that's a minor nitpick for what is otherwise, it seems to be a very capable box, although it is duplicating a lot of functions I already have available to me in other platforms. Yeah. Not having Amazon's instant video player on Android, I think, is one of my biggest complaints, though, overall. Mm -hmm. But that's not a complaint against this particular box. So, yeah. Fire TV. We would have Seems been much solid. more excited today had Amazon Prime been released or Amazon Instant Video been released for all Android devices, not just Amazon's Android devices. We're going to get hands-on with Amazon's Fire TV and Roku's new streaming stick as soon as we can get our hands on them. And it'll be interesting to see how fast they can do sort of dedicated applications. Obviously, they're looking at Roku's model here in a big way. Um, and, or you can say Apple TVs, but I think Roku, I don't know. I, I think so. Uh, that and just having that performance too. Mm -hmm. For for what going forward, you don't right. want to build a product today that's just going to seem outdated in a couple of months in terms of overall performance, especially well, when it comes to gaming. And that's what's going to be interesting. Right? The, the streaming sticks very very inexpensive, but are not going to scale well over the years. Probably okay for for basic uh, video streaming apps. Not so okay if you want to do more extensive applications like games. Is that the Samsung 8000? Woo, the F8000. Now, you know what? Samsung's 2014 televisions will actually start shipping later this week. But we thought we'd take a moment to take a look at one of the best LCDs of 2013 that is continues to still be available right now. And please say hello to the Samsung F8000 series smart TV technology. We're talking screen sizes from 46 up to 55, 60, 65, and 75 inch versions. 1080p screen resolution. 240 hertz true refresh rate. The arc stand, which we'll show you in a bit, actually gets this TV very low to the yeah. table, which I've somewhat noticed, and it's a fixed uh, stand design too, so there's no swivel Two with fingers. the stand attached. <laughs> very, very low to the table. Slim bezel design, I believe about 0.2 inches around the border of this screen. Four HDMI ports in yeah. the back, three USB, including one that was rated for one amp for hard drive use, which I was really pleased to see. 
Overall weight with the stand attached, it's gonna be about 40.3 pounds. Ditch the stand and it's down to a felt 37.1 pounds. I have to say it's the new updated generation of their Smart Touch remote. Compared to the first time I held one of these, this one is way easier to use, right. I'm finding, in terms of flicking your thumb on a touch surface and navigating menus and things like that. This works fantastic. I really do love it. As a Samsung LCD and as their flagship LCD continuing, it features all of their greatest LCD tech, including the best motion resolution I've seen on any LCD to date. They're, they're claiming 1,200 lines of resolution mm -hmm. in motion, which nice. is the best they currently offer. Edgelet local dimming, which is tough to do. Not many edgelet screens are going to feature an ability to dim specific parts of the screen in order to produce a more contrasted image. And in terms of minimizing some of the artifacts related with edgelet displays, uh, basically halo effects that can appear around a bright object, this has what they call micro dimming ultimate that actually will go pixel by pixel to help correct issues like that. And some stuff I really love, a feature called Cinema Black that they offer only on their premium sets that says, you know what, when you're watching movies with letterboxed bars, we're gonna go ahead and kill the backlight system behind those black bars so that if you're sitting in a dark room, it looks inky dark as far cool. as that, that transition from the border of the black bar to the screen ed edge. It looks as good as the darkest plasma I've ever seen when that feature is enabled. And that's something I haven't seen on any of their lesser models yet. So that's, that's one way they differentiate this. Also, uh, I mentioned the remote being nice, and that comes in handy with its quad-core CPU, mm -hmm. built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And this is also a Bluetooth controller as well. So I don't actually have to point it at the TV, which I really, really like. Now, for benchmark results, uh, not bad out of the box. I'll come right out and say it. Uh, showing right here, I have the out-of-the-box movie mode. Pay attention really to this DE average. This is showing you the air level and anything below green and generally speaking below three is considered below noticeable results. However, you can see there are some tracking errors going from the darkest grays to the brightest grays as I measured them. You can see red gets a little high here and it switches and then blue takes over and becomes the premium one or the, the most prominent color there. If I switch over to this next graph, you can also see too by default with that same movie mode how the colors track from being very desaturated, almost pure white, out to pure saturated red, green, and the secondary colors as well. Moving right along, I performed a simple two-point grayscale calibration on this set. And here it is prior to my adjustments, and then there it is right after. Bringing the errors way down. Now normally this gets you in the ballpark with a lot of TVs. However, switching over to when I went and remeasured that 10-point grayscale again, Notice that these errors have dropped well below one and actually the average error is less than almost a half, which is excellent. Uh, and you can also see red, blue, and green now are tracking very close to one another. This is giving me very consistent color performance in from the darkest parts of the picture to the brightest parts. And a good TV will respond just like this. Likewise, uh, color management controls are present in the TV. This is without me adjusting much of anything. This is only focusing on the peak saturation of, of the primary and secondary colors. This isn't focusing on those interior shades that, could, that are possible. This is just looking at those, those max values. Again, very, very good. And looking at the saturation sweeps again after calibration, it's still a good result. Uh, you can see that some of these are a little bit off, but generally speaking, the points are hitting the targets, the targets being the square boxes pretty solid. Uh, and finally, I do a color check on every TV I look at right now. This is a, a selection of about 20 or 30 different specific colors, and I can compare them from one set to the next. The average error for these colors is 1.53. That's one of the best results I've ever uh, measured on any set to date. One that comes close would be the Sony W900 display that we looked at, another 1080p display mm -hmm. with excellent color quality. Came in just a hair better than this, but Honestly, that could be up to just some measuring, measuring futs overall. Uh, I loaded up a brand new firmware on this TV before I took a look at it. It actually improved the game mode performance. Uh, with it turned off, when you turn game mode off on this TV, it's going to hit about 116.6 milliseconds. That's generally a lot of delay for any game scenario. Turning it on now gets it down to about 46.7 milliseconds. Not the best, but significant improvement over what other, other Samsung displays were doing, and better than this TV was when it originally shipped. Hmm. So if you are looking for the best performance, though, for your, your gaming scenarios when you're plugging your consoles in, if you want the least response time, uh, minimizing that on a TV, I would look at some of the latest Sony TVs. They just seem to be doing it better than everyone right now. Really? And like I said, overall benchmark test results were good. Looking at video processing, though, it produced excellent detail and color were being processed properly as well. That's doing conversions, say, from standard to high def and just in terms of how it's taking that color information and representing it on the screen. 
minimizing things like noise without softening the picture, and providing excellent controls if you're a movie lover in terms of making movies look the way they should while still retaining excellent detail with things like sports content and other programming. Now, bottom line really, this is Samsung's top 1080p LCD and it packs a wonderful punch, specifically once it's tuned up. We're talking terrific color and contrast, picture controls for purists out there, good detail, excellent detail, some of the best I've ever seen on a TV in terms of motion without resorting to video smoothing technologies that can make things look like, you know, soap operas in a sense. Uh, but this is expensive, expensive technology overall. Samsung has an F7100 currently available that is about 600 bucks less at the same size as this 55 inch screen. But it does sacrifice some of those cool backlight tricks like making the, the letterbox bars ultra dark. And instead of having a quad core processor like this one does, it only has a dual core processor. But if you are looking to save a little money and maybe you're gonna be using it in a, in a normal room instead of a, a, a man cave darkened room for, for watching movies, that 600 bucks might be uh, tempting yeah. you to go elsewhere, for, or maybe the 7100 model overall. But very, Both very good televisions. Without a doubt, and I have to say too, I have an older Samsung that I've been using for a while with app support built in, and I almost ignored it because it was too slow. The new quad-core parts in Samsung's TVs are making it to the point where not only you have a good web browser built in, but the app performance overall and, and menu navigation is snappy. Uh, it's to the point where I'm not looking at a, another device to connect to this TV right. right away, a game console or a Roku or, or anything, unless I absolutely needed it. Um, with the apps built in for like YouTube and mm -hmm. for uh, Netflix, it will offer that play to TV function as well if you're using a mobile device with it. And things like having a, a built in Wi Fi system that can also act as a router in your living room is another, just a little function that just adds a lot to it. But if you have tried this Samsung remote before too and found it less than optimal, it's gotten so much better. I will agree with that. And it also has the microphone built in too, so you can actually yap right into it. Oh, before I mention too, there's a camera built into this TV and it pops up from the back as some of the <laughs> premium sets do. Hey, for things like, you know, uh, one, you can do motion control if you wanted. You can actually use your hands to, you know, control the TV and that is cool. But for apps that actually use the camera, like Skype and other things, right. You can have this right in the living room and use that as your Skype communication <laughs> interface. Hi, mom! <laughs> but likewise, if you're not, if that bugs you having a camera on a TV like that, just that flick down, locking right. it in, shuts it off, and at least has it pointing straight up if they can somehow turn that back on. But uh, uh, Otherwise, I, I really have no complaints about this TV at all, except for maybe the price and that stand design, as much as I love it. It's low to the ground, and it's, and it's wide without a swivel. 2014 HD TVs are coming, but before we get to our first question of the day, I gotta ask, are you a gamer? Did you buy the Xbox One, the PlayStation 4? You have no more money left. You should be looking at our sponsor, Gamefly.com slash HD Nation, because if you subscribe to Gamefly.com, you can get, check it out, people, Xbox One, PlayStation 4 titles, and of course, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and all that good stuff there. And it's really simple. Uh, you sign up at Gamefly.com slash HD Nation. You're gonna get a free trial for 30 days. It's $22.95 a month there after and you get all the games you want check out a game return it to them get games at a discount if you decide to buy them it's a really cool system to allow you to check out new games or get a hold of classic games at a discount or just to experiment with without spending a lot of money we know you're on a budget you should check out gamefly.com slash hd nation our sponsor if you're looking to get more games in your life without spending all your money Austin writes in, any suggestions on fixing projector screens that have curling edges? I have a BenQ 1080p projector and a manual pull-down screen that's 85 inches diagonally, but I have issues with both sides curling up. If you've never actually seen what's going on here, it's really frustrating, right? Think back to school, if you're not still in school. The teacher pulls the screen down and the edges kind of go in at the middle. And... That's a problem that you can't really fix. I have a portable <laughs> projection screen that is unsupported on the top and the bottom edges, and over the years mm -hmm. I've noticed it too is starting to curl in when I fully extend it. All I can really suggest to you is save up for a properly tensioned screen. Now, every non-tensioned screen I've ever used eventually does curl along mm -hmm. those unsupported edges. And I will say that, at least on the Amazon crowd, uh, the DIY crowd, Elite screens are popular in terms of a either fixed or a retracting tension screen design. Here's one that's actually fixed in terms of you're not going to retract this into the wall. Available in many sizes and it's actually, did they show the back of this? There you go. Yeah. The back of that screen is actually snap attached all the way around the edges, pulling it nice and tight and keeping it that way. Now, depending on how serious your situation is right now, if that curled edge screen you're currently using is bugging you, what's the wall like right behind the screen? If it's not bad and if it's a flat, 
moderately toned uh, yeah. wall that's not too crazily designed. You can actually just shoot the projector right onto that if you had to for the yeah. time being until you get busy to either replace that screen or or perhaps go with a painted painted yeah. screen surface. If you need a retractable screen, there are a number of tensioned uh, retractable screens you can purchase off of Amazon.com and elsewhere. They do cost, they're, they're at a premium compared to the untensioned screens, but unlike the untensioned screens, they will stay flat pretty much for the life of the screen, which is pretty much until you decide to buy a new one. Yeah. Because that, that tension, that elite screen is, is, did you show the one that was? I had one that was just tensioned there and fixed, and here is one that's actually retractable that's and tensioned. What you're for. And yes, you can have it either way. If you if you demand that being able to retract the screen when mm -hmm. you don't need it, they do make tension screens that yeah. way. This one happens to be a little pricey. Uh, this is also incorporating some specific screen technologies you may not need. Shop around though. You you should be able to get something a little bit less than that if you have to. But screens yeah. are one of those things where I will say you really do get what you pay for. Yeah, and, and it, it is a year's investment. Uh, it's, it's not something you're going to get rid no. of every year or two years or three. They last forever, but a tensioned, retractable screen is probably going to cost you twice as much as an untensioned screen. Mike emails 18 at revision3.com. Patrick and Robert, really enjoy your show. I need your help. Been looking for a standard size, backlit, wireless keyboard with either a trackpad or trackball. I found mm -hmm. a few mini keyboards with these features, but they are too small. Thought you might know of a few places to look that carry them. Thanks, Mike. If you mean standard size is in 101 keys, as in the number keypad on the side and a trackball, they exist, but they tend to be awful. There's like two out there, and they have tiny marble-sized trackballs stuffed into cheap plastic keyboards, horrible ratings. Um, if you want full-size keys, you can stand not having number pads. Uh, one of the, the favorite ones out there is IO Gear's multimedia keyboard with laser trackball and scroll wheel. Um, that's available for under 50 bucks. Very, I very like popular. That. It's a nice keyboard, actually. And then Logitech's wireless touch keyboard K400 with built-in uh, multi-touch touchpad or the Logitech Harmony smart keyboard remote we showed off last week. The problem, though, is if you're looking for um, backlit keys, you start getting into the unicorn territory. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think I know of a single wireless backlit keyboard that includes a trackball or trackpad. Yeah. That's but the one that gets me. I don't even think that, yeah, the DeNovo Edge, no, that's got the little swirly wheel, but that's not a track. Um, there might be some third-party stuff out there. I mean, yeah. uh, the off-brands that you might not be aware of, and that's the ones, those are the ones I haven't researched I, enough I have looked at a lot, yeah, even the DeNovo I don't think is backlit. Um, I've looked at a lot of, I've probably looked at all of the off-brands. Yeah, even the DeNovo, which, which has an interesting kind of scrolling trackpad device in there, is not backlit that I know of, although the the sort of function keys are backlit. But a laser trackball built into the keyboard, that works for me. For under 50 bucks? Yeah. It's nice, but it's not backlit. And that, and that was one of our, our issues with the, with the smart keyboard, at least for me, was that I needed to have enough light. I needed to sort of turn it towards the screen to be able to see the keyboard. Uh, if you know one, do us a favor, uh, email HDNation at revision3.com. Quality tweets, hey, at HDNation is a desolation of smog. Blu-ray review upcoming. Hobbits suck, people, almost as much as reality TV, but not, not quite as bad as that. I'll be honest, I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy right <laughs> down do to the not. Hobbit's furry little feet. You really hate Hobbits. They are disgusting little creatures who, who wasted a lot of my time. You watched the movie, so didn't you? <laughs> I uh, one of them. It was all about the <laughs> Rohim. Man loves his horse battles. Uh, my wife grew up rereading The Hobbit and the trilogy every summer, and neither one of us wanted to watch Smog after The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey. It was just too long. They turned one book, one third of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, into three movies. So yeah, I'm actually waiting for a fan to recut the three movies into a single two or three hour opus. That said, The Desolation of Smog hits April 8th. The Blu-ray.com says the video looks gorgeous and the soundtrack is even better. Look at those scores, kids. So if you're a fan, you should be thrilled with the transfer, if not with the extras. Although I think this is one of those things where, like, if you buy the Target version, you get some extras. And if you buy the other version, you get other extras. I'm kind of yes. hating that. Confuse uh, your audience. Confuse your audience. <laughs> Divide the audience. I also want to <laughs> give a shout out to 47 Ronin, the Blu-ray, which looks gorgeous. Looks absolutely gorgeous, but maybe the first... A uh, movie I've ever seen that had zero Man. on the tomato meter. That's the top critics. All the critics gave it a whopping 13% freshness rating. Of the notable releases on Blu-ray this week, Anchorman 2, 74% on the tomato meter, and I hear the Blu-ray looks gorgeous. 
Only the Coen brothers could put Francis McDormand, William H. Macy, Minnesota accents, and a wood chipper together and make an epic movie. Yep, I'm talking Fargo, which has been remastered on Blu-ray, and I'm going to add this one to my collection. For fans of classic westerns, Two Mules for Sister Sarah and Rooster Cogburn are out on Blu-ray, and Sally Field's Oscar-winning turn in Norma Ray is out on a 1080p 2.39 to 1 DTS HD Master Audio Mono. Yes, for authenticity in Fox's 35th anniversary edition. Woo. Excellent. <laughs> hey, you watching us on YouTube.com slash HDNation? Be sure you subscribe and comment down below, like Avenger4421 who says, Opera is smooth. I'll have to try that to see if it works as well as IE for streaming on my machine. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, it's just a weird incident I ran into where it seems like IE is the best streaming browser on the Windows platform, at least. Perhaps but it's the least crufted browser, unless Opera actually is. <sighs> El Bruno Loco Double Zero posts, I want to see a Robert Patrick Home Theater special where you show off your gear one day. I yeah. will see if we can make that happen. Meanwhile, Ryan Thalley is running out of storage on his free NAS Plex server, not to mention SATA ports, and it sounds like he's not ready to upgrade his four two terabyte drives because he also has four three terabyte drives. He says, I'm considering compressing the 40 gigabytes of Blu-ray source rips, but I don't want to lose the losses audio. Is there any software that would let me batch convert the 10 terabyte plus of content fairly easily? I'm thinking hmm. automatically no. Probably not, but uh, that would me that could be a job for make MKV or for handbrake, but I'm pretty sure you're gonna have to manually set up each disc. You won't probably want all of the foreign language soundtracks, for example. Right. You'll just want the main movie and maybe the audio track you specifically right. want. And that's something that you can wrap around and uh, wrap into an MKV file very nicely. Uh, and like I said, too, make MKV or handbrake. And if you're dealing with the Blu ray disc directly, you're going to need something to get around to circumvent the copy protections. Although there are four and. terabyte drives now out in Western Digital Reds. Oh, yeah. That's it for this episode of HD Nation. Tweet your questions at HD Nation or HD Nation at revision3.com. And please subscribe at revision3.com. Com slash HD Nation. Hey, and until next time, thank you for watching. Bye.